Hey guys, just a quick review video for Lesson 228, uh, our introduction to motors uh, that we talked about last week. Um, just kind of want to recap last week for today's class. Uh, next week we're going to get into three-phase motors, which is a little bit of a different uh, situation than these DC and AC single-phase motors. Um, there's some similarities, there's some differences. Uh, so today I just want to kind of camp out on these DC and AC single phase motors so that you have a just kind of a good understanding before we get into three phase of uh, just the operation of motors, the terminology for motors, um, just kind of a, a good review over what we talked about last week, uh, kind of driving it home uh, so that when we get into our next week's lesson, lesson 229, uh, we'll be ready for our, our DC AC motors quiz, but also we'll be ready for discussing three phase motors with a good understanding of single phase and uh, AC motors and DC motors behind us. So let's kind of begin. An electric motor. An electric motor is a machine that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. We've talked about this last week. The two main groups of motors are DC and AC motors. Uh, first off, let's start with the DC motors. Uh, DC motors run off of a magnetic field. This magnetic field could either be a permanent magnet or this magnetic field could be an electromagnet. Depends on um, the size of the motor, depends on the make of the motor. Um, either way, a DC motor runs on the magnetic lines of flux. Uh, from north to south pole between the poles of a magnet. The direction of this magnetic field, like we said before, was the magnetic lines of flux or magnetic flux. And you'll note here in the drawing or in the picture that those lines of flux are running from north to south. Now, again, we've talked about this last week. Conventional current assumes that current flows out of the positive terminal through the circuit and into the negative terminal of the source. That's been the accepted constant uh, for many, many, many years. Um, electron flow is actually what happens. Um, instead of the electrons flowing out of the positive terminal into the negative, it's actually been uh, determined that they flow out of the negative terminal through the circuit into the positive terminal of the source. So for all of our discussion, um, we're going to talk about the electron flow theory, not the conventional current theory. Uh, understanding these magnetic lines of flux, remember magnetic lines of flux wrap around a conductor as current passes through it. The direction that this magnetic flux as it passes around a conductor can be, can be determined using the left-hand flux rule. Now again, this is based off of the electron flow theory and not necessarily the conventional uh, current theory. So using the left-hand rule, left-hand flux rule, lines of magnetic flux surround a conductor. Um, and you'll note here in the drawing, um, as the current is flowing into the page or into your book here, those lines of flux are wrapping around the conductor in this manner. If current was flowing out of the page, as if this was a cross-sectional of a current of a conductor, the lines of flux would wrap around the conductor in this manner and then this direction. <clears throat> Again, this is the left-hand flux rule. Another way to look at it is this. You take your left hand and wrap it around a conductor like so. If the electron flow is passing from this end to this end, the magnetic lines of flux would be wrapped around the conductor in this direction. Which is why when, if you were to coil wire together, those magnetic lines of flux would actually become additive and create a north to south pole an electromagnet. When this current carrying conductor loop is placed between the poles of a magnet, so it's between the north and the south poles, the magnetic fields that surround the conductors and the magnetic field between the magnets both distort. Um, this is what takes place 
forcing the conductor to want to rotate in one direction or another depending on the flow of current. Uh, the simplest way using the electron flow theory to determine the direction of motion is the right hand motor rule. Let's look at that right hand motor rule. Again, the right hand motor rule is based on the electron flow uh, theory, not necessarily the conventional current flow theory. So here's your right hand motor rule. Your thumb indicates the direction that the loop is going to want to move or rotate towards. Uh, your pointer finger is facing the field or the, the magnetic field of the two magnetic poles, north to south. And current, or your, your middle finger, indicates the direction that current is flowing through the loop. So again, direction the conductor will move, the direction of magnets, lines of flux, and the direction of current, or electrons, actually, through the conductor. This is the right-hand motor rule. So you'll see here in this drawing, uh, this person's right hand is next to the north pole of this magnet. His pointer finger is indicating the direction that the magnetic field or the lines of flux coming from the north and entering the south is, is directing. His middle finger is indicating the direction that the electrons are flowing through the loop. And his thumb is indicating the direction that this loop is going to want to rotate. This arm here will have upward motion, whereas this arm here would have downward motion. Looking at this right hand right here, current is flowing in the direction that the middle finger is pointing, or elect, uh, not current, but electrons. The electron flow is passing in the direction that the middle finger is pointing. The field still stays the same. It's north to south. So his middle, his pointer finger is pointing in the direction of the south pole. And the thumb indicates that we're going to have downward motion on this loop right here. So there's our magnetic lines of flux. There's our magnetic lines of flux that are surrounding the conductor because electrons are passing through it. And these magnetic lines of flux are interacting with these magnetic lines of flux. And just like opposites, they repel or force away, forcing the loop to want to rotate, which gives us our upward and downward motion. And since it's on a set axis, it's going to rotate and not just flop away. This rotational force exerted on each half of the conductor loop depends on the strength of the magnetic field between the poles of the magnet and the strength of the current through the loop. So that means is the stronger the magnet, the, the greater the current passing through the loop, the more rotational force we're going to get out of this loop, uh, which means we'll get more speed or more strength. <clears throat> the strength of these magnetic fields determine the amount of force applied to the loop. Uh, this rotational turning force is referred to as torque. Uh, make sure you have that in your notes. I might ask about that in the quiz after this video. So, between points 1 and 3, I have the most amount of torque. Between points 2 and 4, I have the least amount of torque applied to my motor. So as the loop is rotating through these lines of flux, it's getting more torque every time it passes 1 and 3. When it passes 2 and 4, it has almost zero torque uh, impressed upon the loop itself, and it's running solely on its own momentum. Now, if we were not to uh, change the direction of that electron flow every time it looped, our, our in reality, the loop would come to a standstill at those two points between two and four because current is only flowing in one direction. 
Um, so a, a device known as a commutator, and again, write that down because it's probably going to be in your quiz, is used in a DC motor to reverse the current through the loop every one half rotation. The loop's uh, commutator assembly is called an armature, and that is what rotates inside the motor housing. So a commutator, it's like a split between your, uh, your loop so that every time current passes, every time it loops, it changes the direction that current passes through the loop so that the loop can continue in the same direction constantly without coming to a standstill um, between its zero torque positions. So like in this drawing here, you can see there's a split right here and this is, would be your commutator, this ring right here. Current is flowing in this direction and it's in position one. This position provides quite a bit of torque, forces the, the armature to rotate. When it's in position two, the armature is receiving very little torque to no torque at all. It's solely running on its own momentum. If we did not split the direction of electron flow through the loop, this armature would come to rest right here. Uh, but because we split right here the direction of electron flow, the armature is allowed to continue to rotate. And now you'll notice, whereas before the electron flow was flowing from the darker shaded part of the loop to the lighter shaded part of the loop, now it's flowing from the lighter shaded part of the loop to the darker shaded part of the loop, allowing this to rotate over and over again. The conductors from the DC power supply are not directly connected to the commutator. If they were, um, they would definitely get tangled up and it wouldn't work. Um, so the commutator needs to be able to spin freely, uh, yet still receive electrons from the source. So conductive carbon brushes are held against the commutator with springs and the DC supply conductors are attached to the brushes. This allows the electrons to flow into the commutator through the loop without the soldering or fixing of wires to the loop itself, allowing it to spin freely. Now we talked about zero torque. Zero torque is when that, that loop or that armature is in the, the two or fourth position um, every quarter and three quarter turn. Uh, it's a neutral position. It means there's no magnetic field uh, impressing torque upon it. With no torque applied, the rotational speed drops. Um, so as that, as the torque increases, the speed increases. As the torque is reduced, the speed is reduced. And let's just face it, with uh, motor loads, we can't have an increase in speed, a decrease in speed, an increase in speed, a decrease in speed, over and over again. So this torque needs to be balanced out uh, so that when one, when the armature reaches zero torque, it has an, still the ability to have torque impressed upon the armature. In order for that to happen, um, we're gonna use many coils of wire for each armature loop. This increases the strength of the magnetic field surrounding the loop. The stronger magnetic field increases the motor's torque. Each loop is then connected to a different set of commutator segments so that each loop gets current or electron flow in the direction designed to allow it to continue to rotate in the same direction. So like I said, a practical DC motor utilizes many coils of wire for each armature loop. You can see in this diagram here, here's the commutator, all the splits between each loop, multiple loops allowing whenever this one's receiving full torque, this one's receiving no torque, uh, the rotation of the motor doesn't slow down because it's constantly receiving torque on one of its loops or more of its loops. 
So let's talk about some definitions and some terminology for motors. Uh, again, I'd put these in your notes. You're probably going to get some of these in the quiz. First things first, we have a stator. The stator stays put. Uh, it is what creates the electromagnetic field um, that pushes the armature uh, that we talked about. This would be a non-permanent magnet stator or a permanent magnet stator, depending on the type of motor. Um, like I said, it can create an um, electromagnetic field or a um, permanent magnetic field. Uh, so that would be a stator. Our stator stays put and creates the magnetic field. Our commutator. Our commutator receives the, the current or the electrons from the source at the brush assembly and distributes it into the armature loops, allowing it to pass current or electrons through the loop, creating a magnetic field around each loop itself. And as that magnetic field increases and interacts with the stator, we get a rotational force. Here's the armature. That's the, uh, the all the loops together. The brush assembly. These are the carbon brushes that have springs that push them up against the commutator so that they receive the electrons from the source. The shaft. Well, remember what we talked about last week. The shaft does all the work. That's what does the work of rotating whatever the motor is trying to rotate, whether it be a pulley, a wheel, a fan, you name it. So the stator is the magnet that applies the force on the magnetic lines of flux to the conductor loop. It's either a permanent magnet or electromagnet. Um, permanent magnets are used in smaller motors. Uh, typically like little RC cars or um, some of the earlier power tools of uh, battery powered power tools. Um, the stator poles in larger motors are typically electromagnets and the stator consists of an even number of field poles. Each field pole is made by wrapping many coils of wire around two pieces. When the current passes through the field winding, the pole pieces are magnetized. Uh, creating an electromagnet. Oh, there are different types of DC motors. In a series DC motor, the field is connected with this in series with the armature. You can see here in the drawing, the DC voltage that's powering the motor is also powering the electromagnet, which turns the motor. This is uh, great for torque. Um, and it's also used often as a universal motor because it can be used in DC or AC applications. So that's a series motor. A shunt motor, you'll notice has DC line voltage here and DC line voltage here. This DC line voltage runs through the loop of the armature and this DC line voltage runs through the shunt field for the electromagnetic field that is applied to the armature. Uh, this offers great speed regulation. Not so much in the torque, but it does good for speed regulation. Now, if you want to get both good torque, starting power, and speed control, a compound motor, you'll notice it's very similar to the shunt motor, except it adds a series field winding uh, in line with the motor's loop itself. For a permanent magnet motor, the motor's direction of rotation can be simply reversed by changing polarity of the DC power leads to the armature leads. Uh, very similar to when you switch the direction on your electric drill, your battery power drill. You're switching the leads, allowing it to go from uh, positive to negative to negative to positive. Um, for larger motors that use field windings instead of permanent magnets, the direction of rotation of a DC motor may be reversed using one of the me these methods, either reversing the direction of the current through the field or reversing the direction of current through the armature. Uh, the beautiful thing about DC motors is they're super simple when it comes to changing direction. 
all you got to do is reverse the leads or all you got to do is reverse the current through the field one of the two the nameplate on dc motors provides important information necessary for correctly applying the dc motor with a dc drive whenever you're doing an install you need to be checking out the nameplates of these motors. Um, what horsepower is it? How many volts does it take? Um, what type of wound motor is it? Is it a shunt? Is it a series? Is it a compound? Um, what's its what's its overall rating? So nameplates super important. And I gave you these formulas last week, but I'm going to put them in front of you again. Uh, the one I really want you to pay attention to is this guy right here, the efficiency formula. Output power divided by input power. Um, I might even ask you a question about the efficiency of a DC motor uh, on your quiz, so be prepared. I'd write that formula down. Uh, horsepower is... The torque times speed or the force uh, times distance divided by time yep so horsepower times 746 because it's been determined that um, it's about 746 watts for one horsepower so if I've got a 10 10 horsepower motor I take 10 multiply it by 746 and that equals 7,460 watts for that 10 horsepower motor roughly and then I divide it by its input power it's amperage times voltage using Ohm's law there are different NEMA classifications for these motors the insulation it's based on the insulation classes so there's NEMA A B F and H um, operating motor above its the limits of its insulation class reduces its life expectancy so know what type of motor we're installing in what area what ambient temperature uh, you name it different insulation classes can handle different temperatures all right let's look at AC motors we've looked at DC motors let's talk about AC motors an AC motor runs on just that alternating current it doesn't run on DC uh, so because of that we don't need to change direction like we did with our DC motors through a commutator um, this is based solely on induction um, so let's let's look at our AC motors together here's uh we're gonna get into the definitions uh, this is the terminal box also known as the motor pecker head um, we talked about that last week um, I'm gonna leave that alone leave that to your own imaginations this is a uh, where the terminal termination is made to the AC circuit coming in um, and these leads are directly connected to the stator in the motor uh, the pecker head leads go directly to the stator which creates uh, an induction or a magnetic field uh, a fluctuating magnetic field it also goes to the field windings in the stator as well or the start field the run winding and the sta uh, the start winding the rotor the rotor rotates rotors rotate uh, this is what turns inside uh, of the motor forcing the shaft to rotate this turns based off of induction coming from the fluctuating magnetic field in the stator the shaft the shaft is what does the work the shaft is what turns the the wheels that turns the fan turns the belt you name it whatever the DC the AC motor is installed for the stator there's where you get your magnetic field uh, this is directly connected to the pecker head um, and it's basically like similar to an electromagnet it's loops of wire and then there's your enclosure that's what protects the, the motor itself 
There are many different AC motor types out there because each type is confined to a narrow band of operating characteristics. These characteristics include torque, speed, service. Uh, types of single phase motors include shaded pole, capacitor, split phase, universal, synchronous. I will be asking a question about that on the, the quiz after the video. Keep that in mind. So shaded pole, capacitor, split phase, universal, synchronous. An AC motor does not need a commutator because the AC is going back and forth. It's not all one direction. It's alternating current. So we don't need to split it like we did with our armature loop. In fact, an AC motor works by the changing polarity of the current running through the stator. That current running through the stator um, induces upon the rotor, and since the rotor is shunted uh, on both ends, that current creates a magnetic field, and for uh, that rotor wants to rotate uh, similar to uh, the magnetic field in our DC motors that was uh, induced because we ran current through the loop. There's no real loop in an armature or in a an AC motor rotor. It's a shunted, typically a bar or a, what looks like a squirrel cage. Uh, that shunted bar uh, is induced upon creating a magnetic field uh, creating counter EMF um, and when properly balanced out will rotate especially if it's already started to rotate as you can see here here's an example of the polarity and a magnet changes in a magnetic field when our magnet is in the one position there is no magnetic field as current starts to pass through it in our magnetic field starts to increase. We have north here, south here. As our sine wave comes to a peak, our magnet comes to a peak and it's at its strongest. When it reaches five, it's at its weakest. When it reaches seven, it's at its strongest in the opposite direction. Our north is now here and our south is down here and so on and so forth. This happens 60 times per second, this alternation. In a motor. The speed of the rotating magnetic field in the stator is referred to as synchronous speed of the motor. Synchronous speed decreases as the number of poles increase. So if I have just a two pole motor, I have a synchronous speed of 3600. 3, um, whereas if I have a 10 pole motor, I have a synchronous speed of 720 RPM. So let's look at the formula for determining the synchronous speed. Our synchronous speed equals 120 times the frequency divided by the number of poles. So if we have a two pole motor, our frequency is 60 hertz. 120 times 60 divided by two equals 3600 RPM. That's how we can determine our synchronous speed for each of these AC motors single phase. So SS equals 120 times F divided by P, or number of poles. Although it's theoretically possible to control the speed of an AC motor by varying the voltage, um, it's not a good way to change the speed of the motor. Remember the example that I shared last week about how my dad um, installed a ceiling fan but used uh, an old rotary dimmer to try to control it. Uh, it worked not well. Uh, eventually, the motor had to be replaced, or the fan had to be replaced real in reality, uh, because it didn't it didn't bear well on the windings of that motor. Uh, that motor has a fixed resistance, and if I decrease the voltage, and I'm going to increase its amperage because that fixed resistance, uh, which is going to create heat which is going to create more resistance, which is going to create more amperage, which is going to create more heat, and eventually it's going to break down the motor. In fact, if the voltage is changed more or less than 10%, the motor may be damaged and need to be replaced. So the two practical methods of AC motor speed control are to change the number of poles 
or to change the number of the frequent the change the frequency from 60 hertz to 50 to 40 uh, using a frequency changing uh, drive when it comes to reversing an AC motor you can't reverse an AC motor by simply swapping the leads coming in like you could with a DC motor uh, every motor is not built the same some single phase motors cannot even be reversed so keep that in mind when you're trying to isolate if you need to reverse your motor you may have a motor that is not reversible so please check that out before you uh, try to swap leads around for those that can um, be re reversed they have instructions on which terminations to swap in order to effectively reverse the motor typically these are t5 and t8 terminations um, it's not just swapping the AC lead coming in it's swapping the leads going to the start running and the the, the run winding our formulas for AC motors input power in kilowatts equals 0 0.76 I'm sorry 0 0.746 times the power in horsepower that would be your input power formula for horsepower rating of a motor equals output power in horsepower equals 1.34 times the input power in kilowatts um, reason I say that is more and more motors are actually being stamped with their kilowatt ratings nowadays along with their horsepower ratings um, again horsepower was an older term used way back in the day to sell motors to people or farmers or mill workers and whomever who used to use horses to do the work uh, motors were then sold or sold as equivalent to 10 horses or five horses to do the same work so again the, the formula for efficiency of an AC motor equals um, efficiency equals output power divided by input power now the only difference between this and the DC formula is if you note right here the power factor you need to include that power factor uh, when it comes to determining your your uh, efficiency for an AC motor and that power factor is typically stamped on the nameplate I'll give you a second to write these formulas down but you should already have them down in your notes you can always come back to this part of the video the basic characteristics of each AC motor are type are determined by the design of the motor and the supply voltage used uh, NEMA has uh, four different designs for AC motors uh, you got your A B C and D and each one has different starting torques different starting current breakdown torques full load slip uh, and typical applications where they're used uh, so know your NEMA designs uh, what uh, when you're replacing a motor it's always important to check out on the nameplate what NEMA design is it and this will typically be stamped on the nameplate as well and here's just a larger version of it so here are some terms to know and I'd write these down because I'm probably going to ask you about these as well starting torque starting torque also known as locked rotor torque that's the amount of torque it takes to get the motor from its locked stopped position to start remember an object at rest tends to stay at rest so it's going to take more amperage to get that already resting motor up to speed breakdown torque is the amount of torque a motor can handle before it starts to break down under the the strain of the load applied to it means uh, the motor was overloaded with whatever it was trying to drive at that point the breakdown torque of the motor reached its limit and the motor starts to literally just break down full load torque it's running it's full load running to reach its nameplate rated rpms that's the amount of torque it takes to reach its nameplate rpms and then pull up torque is what it takes to get to that full load torque remember it takes more amperage or more power to get a slow moving motor up to speed so those are your four definitions or terms to know uh, 
starting torque, breakdown torque, full load torque, and pull-up torque. Compared to DC motors, three-phase motor and three-phase motors, single-phase motors are difficult to start and must employ different special starting methods. Um, if you recall from our video that we showed last week, uh, we have two fluctuating magnetic fields that are trying to cancel each other out. Um, so in order to get that motor started, one of those fields needs to be counter uh, canceled out. Uh, this is done through the starting uh, through the start winding. Once the start winding is uh, engaged and the motor starts to turn, even if that start winding was disengaged, that motor would continue to turn in the same direction. So, like I said, single phase motors contain both run and start windings. Start windings to help start it, run windings to keep it going. Overloading a motor is the leading cause for motor uh, overheating and literally just its failure. Environmental conditions can also cause motor failure due to overheating. So th these kind of include high temperatures or high altitudes where the motor may not be able to breathe well enough to cool down. I know it sounds silly, but it needs the needs that air to cool it down, cool down the windings. Um, another factor that can lead to overheating is the frequent starting and stopping of a motor uh, the on, on and off on and off again uh, that's what breaks it down and this looks like it's just our safety lesson from that week I believe we went over that in class so I'm not going to go over it here again yep so just so that you're aware there will be a quiz after this video. I know this is a little shorter of a video and some of you are probably thinking, oh, I've, we talked about this last week. Why is he talking about it again? We're about to get into three phase motors uh, where it's a little bit different, but a lot of the fundamentals that we learn here carry over into three phase motors. So reviewing is never a bad thing when it comes to, to these type of scenarios. So there will be a quiz your attendance for the night is based on whether you watch this video and took that quiz let me restate this for your hearing if you do not take the quiz you will not get credit for tonight's class period I'm not here to monitor the class I'm here to point out that you need to take the take the quiz watch the video take the quiz if you do not take the quiz, you will not get credit for tonight's class and you will miss four hours because of tonight's class. If you have questions, text me. Other than that, I'll see you on Tuesday next week for lesson 229. You can find the quiz for this video on the CMS. Please make sure you fill it out to the best of your ability. I'll catch you guys later. You have a safe rest of your evening and a safe time at work. Later.